Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Michael Hurd. I'm the chair of Hospice UK, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our 2015 conference, the subject, The Art and Science of Hospice Care. As a lifelong supporter of Liverpool Football Club, pause for booze, uh, I'm really thrilled to be welcoming you all to Liverpool um, for this conference. Everything that is on our agenda at this conference is designed to help you. To help you, the trustees, the senior managers, the clinical staff of our hospices to meet and overcome the challenges that we all face. You know perfectly well what those challenges are. To improve hospice care, to bring it to the needs of those very large numbers of people who presently need palliative care but don't get it, and to do all this in a very, very difficult financial climate. We know, every one of us in this hall, we know we have a glorious past. We know we have a glorious present. But we know that neither is a guarantee of a glorious future. So we're all going to have to work hard uh, in the new world which we're moving into. And this conference is designed to help us all, as I say, meet and overcome those challenges. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, without whom this conference would not have been possible, the Access Group and Hayes McIntyre, our two headline sponsors, the local hospice lottery, who've sponsored this evening's drinks reception, Lloyd's Pharmacy Healthcare Services, who've sponsored tomorrow's conference dinner, and the National Garden Scheme for their generous support of hospice care, but who are in particular supporting the Innovation Awards which will be presented at this evening's reception. And um, I would also encourage you to talk to and visit our exhibitors. I have uh, one more duty before I hand over this rostrum. As you all know, um, we owe an enormous debt to David Prail, who retired as our chief executive earlier this year. And it's my very pleasant duty to introduce to you this morning our new chief executive, Tracy Bleakley. The board of trustees of Hospice UK entrusted the very considerable responsibility of recruiting our new CEO to a committee. Um, it took quite a time. It was an exhaustive and exhausting process. But in the end, the committee were unanimous in deciding that of all those who applied, and very many did, Tracy was the outstanding candidate. So I'm absolutely delighted to ask Tracy Bleakley, our new CEO, to say a few words to you this morning. Tracy. Thank you, Michael, and good morning, everyone. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for such a warm welcome here today. Um, not just today, also, but on Twitter and the warm emails and letters that people have sent me. The reason I'm here, because I haven't started in the role yet, and I won't do so until January, is really to meet as many of you as possible and to start learning about the work that you do. This is hugely important. I'm not going to talk about the challenges that we face, the, the massive changes that we're facing and some of the opportunities, because that's what this conference is all about. And over the coming weeks and months, I'll be working with the team to figure out how we go on addressing those, supporting you and helping to represent you. And that's going to be a huge focus of our work. So you'll hear more about that next year. What I just wanted the opportunity to do was tell you a little bit about me. Um, and the first thing I want to say is that although I'm based at King's Cross, I live in Bedfordshire, 
and you might tell from the accent that I'm from Bolton. So I have no intention of being London-centric. I want to be on the road, I want to be out meeting you, I want to be in the thick of things, I want to be learning about what you do. So as well as meeting you today, if you want to organise a visit, please do get in touch with the office and we'll get that booked in the diary because I want to be out and about. I've had quite the varied career. Uh, I did an engineering degree, mechanical and electrical, and worked on the railways at university, fixing trains for a living to get myself through university. I then became a management consultant and went around the world with Price Waterhouse, uh, Anderson Consulting, Accenture, and ended up in ITV. And through that time, 13 years, really working on restructures, mergers, acquisitions, finance, HR, operations, logistics, procurement, and getting that real business background. But the thing I really loved was when I went home in the evening and I did work for local charities and community groups. And I started to realize that that was the important part of my life. And why wasn't I doing that for a living? Now, I did an MBA to broaden myself out and started applying for jobs in the third sector several years ago. And it was really difficult at first to convince people, it's fine being a volunteer, but if you're going to go and work for an organization at quite a senior level, how do they know a management consultant would fit in? Is it going to be, are they going to be the sort of person that's going to understand my organization? And I was very lucky with my first job, um, working in a public health organization, tackling overweight and obesity in children and families with community programs, because the chief exec was a former management consultant, and we had that rapport. So I, I got my first piece of good luck. I worked there for three years, and that was really important in terms of not just learning about public health, but also about partnerships, about community working, how we can pull together capacity building, learning, training, development, and how we can all tackle a universal issue. I then became chief executive of an organization called PFEG, a charity, snappy name, personal finance education group. And we ran a long campaign to get financial education on the national curriculum, which was successful. Once I'd done that, what teachers needed was the training and support and education so that they could deliver good, high-quality financial education for young people. So I merged the organisation with Young Enterprise, who had the mechanism to do that and get into schools. Following that, I joined my current organisation, which is different again, the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners. So now I represent a membership organisation that looks after senior Conservative Party politicians, Labour Party politicians, and independent police and crime commissioners who don't want to be anything to do with politicians, and pull them all together to get that single coherent voice. So I'm well versed in membership organisations and representation. Uh, it's an interesting time at the moment. I, I had hoped to be able to move into this role quite quickly without any fuss, but unfortunately, um, as you'll have seen in the press, there's quite a lot going on in terms of the funding formula at the moment. Um, so there's still quite a lot of work still to do. I'm so privileged to be standing here, about to be joining this organisation and to be working with you all. The work that you do is phenomenal, uh, and I'm so excited. So thank you very much for the warm welcome, and I'm looking forward to meeting you all over the course of the next three days. Thank you. I'd now like to hand over to Professor Bill Noble. Thank you very much, Tracy. Welcome, everybody. And uh, it's, it's started pretty well already, hasn't it? You have a new chief executive, and it's great to see the organization doing so well. I'm particularly grateful to this organization because uh, Help the Hospices funded my MD. It started me on the road to palliative care. And I was, um, the guy that uh, really was my guru at the time was Professor Eric Wiltz, who was one of the founders of Help the Hospices. And I know that him, uh, he had a passion about spreading the word, about making palliative care integrated into the health service into, and spreading hospices throughout the, the country. And I know that he would, he, if he were here, which sadly he isn't, um, he, he died a few years ago, I know that he would have been very pleased to see you going from strength to strength. And even better, as medical director of Marie Curie, I'm very pleased that our nine hospices are now within this organization as members as well. So that's, that's enough of that. It gives me 
great pleasure to introduce to you Margaret McCartney. I know her through her uh, column in the BMJ, and I, I, as I said to her, anyone who can write a, a weekly column has my admiration. Uh, in addition to that, she seems to be on the right side of most arguments. So I'm very much looking forward to what she has to tell us today. Margaret. Thank you so much for having me today. It's a real privilege, and I've got a real um, conflict of interest decoration coming up here. But um, the kindest people I knew at medical school, David, um, were definitely the people that went on to become palliative care physicians and nurses. So thank you for everything you do. I, I work as a GP in the West End of Glasgow, and I do other things around that. This is my conflict of interest declaration. I benefit from the odious quaff points, so sorry for that. Doing my best to tear it down slowly. I earn money from freelance writing and broadcasting. I um, invested some money in Who Made Your Pants. Do go and look them up online. They're a great organisation. And they're fully, my conflicts of interest are fully listed at whopaysthisdoctor.org. You're all welcome to join me by signing up with your public declaration of interest, should you choose to. So this is what's happening. We're all going to die. No surprise to anyone. And what's really very much more unsurprising is that as you get older, you're increasingly more likely to die. Um, this is from a great gaff, um, David Spiegelhauter, who's a professor for understand public understanding of risk in um, Oxford, has made up. But what I find really interesting about that is that most 100-year-olds will not die that year. So even when you get really old and frail, the chances are that year is not going to be the year that you die in, which is really interesting. And it means that for a substantive portion of my population that I'm looking after in general practice, I'm dealing with old, frail people who very often are not going to die. And that's, a, that's an interesting thing. How do we really predict these people well? There's something else happening too. As you know, we're living longer and men and women are living more equally longer. So the, the gap between men and women is narrowing as time goes on. And the other thing that's happening is we're not just living longer. We're accumulating more diseases, disorders, and medication as we do so. So as you get older, you're getting more and more diagnosis. So 85-year-olds, most 85-year-olds have got at least two, if not four, disorders, all of which they're probably on two or three medications each for. Um, it's a polypharmacy nightmare, in, in my view. And we're really ill-equipped to deal with this. Our guidelines are for single disorders. They're not for multimorbidity. They're not for frailty. And that means we are ripe in, for over-treatment and over-diagnosis. And as well as that, there's a real inequity in here. Because if you live in a deprived area, that graph has moved 10 years to the left. So you'll get your multimorbidity early. So we're all going to die. We might die a bit older with frailty and with more diseases or more medication. And it's still quite hard to predict who's going to die. Um, this is a, a lovely drawing um, from Great Expectations, just looking at what the aged P was like um, a couple of hundred years ago. And this was an old person who probably was about 45 in <laughs> Dickens' era, um, looking very frail and ordering and bossing his son around as to, to what he was going to do. And it's all changed now. Here's a dentist who took up running when he was 85, who broke the World Sprint Championship for 200 metres at the age of 95, and probably was running a lot faster than some younger people. So really, what is ageing? How do we tell who's going to die? You get fit older people as well as unfit younger people. And social inequity has a big role. If you're poor, you're going to die younger and with more diseases at a younger age. So I'm going to just take you through just a, a not a real life example, but very similar to lots of cases that I, I would deal with as a GP. Um, a lady called Rosa, who is 72 and she has lung cancer. And she's on lots of medication. She's on medication for blood pressure, for cholesterol, for osteoporosis, and for COPD. She's breathless, she's in pain, she's frail, and she lives with her husband in a first floor flat. So fairly typical kind of patient, and I'm sure you would deal with very similar um, scenarios. And what's really interesting about that is the most predictive thing for what's going to happen to Rosa and her, her likelihood of death is not her cancer or her COPD, it's her frailty. It's frailty that's the best predictor of death. I just find that fascinating. You know, we have chronic disease registers, we have cancer registers, but we're not very good at dealing with frailty as a risk factor for death in general practice or perhaps in palliative care more broadly, I don't know. But in any case, Rosa's come back from the hospital to tell me that she's having chemotherapy. She's nauseous, she's exhausted, she's breathless, but she does not want to give up without a fight. 
And she tells me quite firmly that she's not ready for morphine yet, doctor. Keep me going a bit longer. So what do I know about chemotherapy for her kind of cancer, non-small cell lung cancer? Well, she's not fit for surgery or COPD is put paid to that. She relapses after her first cycle and I go and look up the Cochrane reviews and find that the trials of chemotherapy that she's been recommended will result in a 27% reduction in death. And she says, yeah, that's pretty much what they told me. They told me I could cut down my risk of dying by quite a bit. But the other way of looking at that is a change in our one year survival from 15 to 25% or a median survival increase of 1.5 months. That's from a four month average to 5.5 months average. And what's really interesting is the Cochrane reviewers said that that meant there was hope of progress for chemotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer and suggest that chemotherapy has a role. But when we eventually talked to Rosa and her family slowly and carefully over the coming weeks, Rosa doesn't think chemotherapy has a role. And in fact, she's a bit pissed off that someone thought that chemotherapy did have a role for her. We also know that chemotherapy in this kind of situation has unintended harms, so 40% of people dying from cancer do have palliative chemo within four months of death, but more people in that situation will die in intensive care. More people are referred late for hospice care, and less people die in their preferred place. So there are issues connected with recommending more chemo in this situation. And of course, you all know about the other great intervention that can help in this kind of scenario, the famous New England Journal of Medicine graph that shows that early palliative care not just improves quality of life, but also quantity of life for someone like Rosa. And again, here's another great graph, this one from The Lancet, showing that, again, palliative care improves prognosis in people who have end-stage COPD. What a great intervention. Why don't we use it more? So Rosa would benefit from palliative care, I'm pretty sure about that, and chemotherapy might not give her what she wants. Because these are the really big questions. How does she want to live and how does she want to die? What kind of treatment burden would she like to accept? Her big issue is, I don't want to be in pain and I feel as though I should be fighting this more. And I'm always quite impressed with why people feel they should fight and where that's coming from. These are a collection of posters that I send my children to photograph for me in and around London and Glasgow. The top ones from the Beatston Cancer Centre. Be full of hope, be courageous, be ready to fight, be positive, beat cancer sooner, all of us versus cancer. There's a real battle analogy in there. And I think battle analogies can help some people, but I think they do huge, uncounted harms for many more people who feel as though they're unable to step off that medical escalator because they keep being afraid of being accused of not fighting their illness enough. And when we look at the research evidence, there is really good research evidence that says that no specific psychological coping styles are helpful. And even more, some patients felt that their responses of their physicians to encourage them to fight or battle their cancer meant that they actually were resisting the expression of emotional distress. They couldn't say, actually, I'm scared about what I'm doing here. I'm worried about whether this is the right thing. Can't I just stop? And I'm really concerned that so many cancer charities continue to use these kind of analogies in fundraising missions in particular. So in terms of Rosa's needs, it's all about caring for her but very careful, caring honesty, stepwise talking, not all the information at once, everything that you do every day, and enough time, and this is my biggest challenge as a general practitioner, is how to make sure I give this lady and her family enough time to make sure she's got adequate pain relief and quality of life in her terms, and how to make her feel no guilt with not fighting. That's a really hard thing to do, and I do think the Daily Mail has a lot to explain, which I'm going to come to. So the next thing we have to do as part of trying to make sure Rosa gets the kind of care that she needs is to talk about her needs and try and get them down in some kind of plan to put that across so that general practitioners have it, so that at the hospital have it, so out of hours care have it. And the problem is it all seems to come down to this. Do you want us to let you die? Over 75, sign here if you're ready for death. And this refers to the cack-handed and stupid idea that you could send in nurses who didn't know any patients in order to get them to sign a DNR form, essentially. And of course, the truth was a bit more subtle than that. The idea was to try and improve end-of-life care. How could we do that? We want people to express their wishes. What do they and do they not want to happen to them? So the, the kernel of truth was there. That's a good idea to do. But you don't do it all at once with someone who wasn't expecting you to go around with questions that you haven't been able to consider with your family and in your own time. An absolute um, elephant at your door, not a careful, honest, kind conversation. 
And I think this has made it much harder, this kind of tenor of reporting has made it much harder for us to actually have conversations about DNR and do not resuscitate orders. These are the forms that we have in Glasgow. And there's been a huge issue with do not resuscitate forms. So we have to, and after the Janet Tracy hearing, of course, um, what we have to do is we have to tell people if we're going to put a DNR notification in notes, which I have no issue with. I think it's a good idea. I think people should have full access to all their notes. They should actually absolutely know what's going on. But the problem is the way that we see um, DNR and CPR. We don't seem to have a handle on who it's good for and who it's bad for. And these bright red forms are designed to be kept in the hallway of patients who are um, going to have a DNR um, order on their notes. And they're meant to be kept in the hall so that any passing ambulance man that's called knows not to start doing chest, chest compressions on the patients. And I can see why this might be a good idea. The other idea they had was a sticker on the door, which I have to say I thought was a bit biblical. Um, so, so no, no chest compressions in here. What happens if it's the wrong person that's collapsed? <laughs> But this was, this was the great plan, and I think it's created huge amounts of um, problems because it's now seen as something really terrible that we're denying people, something, that's, um, you know, something that we're deciding not to give someone that might have just made a bit of a difference. And at the same time, we're not really considering what kind of death we want to have. I'm always really impressed and, and distressed and slightly staggered with people who tell me they don't want to go into hospital under any circumstances, but they do want resuscitated from their end-stage COPD. So there is this idea that if you don't agree, um, if, you, if you agree to a DNR um, form, somehow you're going to get less good care. Um, I think we've kind of forgotten about community death. Um, certainly when I was we, um, there were still people dying at home supported by not just professionals but by neighbours and families and friends and this is a great um, picture of Lincoln's death when he was brought home to die after he was shot. There's a fantastic story in his biography where um, all his friends and colleagues came to pay tribute to him and spend some time with him and I thought that was absolutely wonderful. And of course, we don't really share images like this of CPR and tubes and chest compressions and electrical shocks and stand clear and blood going everywhere and bruised mouths and battered, cracked ribs. We don't share images like that because they are distressing. And because of that, I think it makes it very hard for people to know why it is that very often CPR is not a good way to die. And we also saw from Brice Marambo, the footballer, collapse in a pitch. Ideal candidate for CPR. Perfect, exactly who you want to resuscitate and whom has made a very good recovery. But the problem is that um, we tend to rely, I think most of the public rely on popular depictions of CPR in order to inform themselves about how good it is to work. So my three favourite TV programmes, Holby City, ER and best of all, Green Wing. Um, it was really good. So in ER or Chicago Hope, 75% of people survive CPR. <laughs> Hobie City or casualty, 46% of people survive. And in America, um, older people in the US rate this as chances of survival from CPR is around about 80%. And in the UK, about 63% of people with COPD rate their chances of survival with as more than 40%. This is end stage COPD. Green Wing is of course the most accurate because no one ever got resuscitated <laughs> in Green Wing. Um, really sort of impressive series of what happens when you do try and resuscitate people who have got cancer in hospital. And if people have got an unanticipated cardiac arrest, you know, they're just in getting some kind of treatment, they're having treatment for an early stage cancer, or they're on an operating table, 22% of them were survive in hospital. But if they had an anticipated cardiac arrest, i.e. if they were dying, no one survives. And I don't know if we're quite honest enough about that um, with our patients, um, and especially in general practice when we're filling out these forms. Somehow it's seen as though we're still denying someone something that might work, when actually what we're trying to do is give them a better quality of death. Here's the Daily Mail's interpretation of DNR forms. Um, this is my favourite one. Cancer patient left terrified after hospital doctor issues him with a do not resuscitate order. So it's a bit of paper that you must grasp with you. A doctor told him that he wouldn't be re revived if he took a turn for the worse, which is a really interesting explanation for death. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a really interesting thing in there about what doctors um, should do, um, which is apparently to consent people, 
according to the Daily Mail, in order to have a DNR form as opposed to what we know to be true, which is that we have no duty to offer ineffective interventions. But somehow CPR and DNR forms have become really polarised and difficult and have made my day-to-day -day conversations with very elderly, frail people who have realistically no chance of surviving CPR much, much harder. So CPR is indeed potentially life-saving and otherwise reasonably well, but there's, it's unlikely to work in people who are frail. There's no evidence it'll work for people who have metastatic cancer. And the real irony for the Daily Mail here is what works at the end of life? It's not CPR that works at the end of life, it's palliative care. But where's the evidence of equity to access for palliative care, which could actually prolong your life in a meaningful way? When we ask doctors what they would like to do in terms of um, their own preferences at the end of life, it's quite clear um, as doctors get older, more of them make advanced care plans for themselves and the vast majority of doctors do not want to have CPR if they suffer any kind of irreversible brain damage, even quite minor brain damage. They don't want IV fluids if they become unwell, they don't want TPN, they don't want ITU, they don't want life-saving surgery if the prognosis is bleak. They're quite firmly saying, actually, you're giving us too much medicine. And I think what I wonder about is whether survival in people who get palliative care earlier works better. It's perhaps because we're not doing more harmful medicine. And I wonder exactly how much of our contemporary medicine is actually doing people just more harm than good. And it's being applied to people well out with the study groups that were originally applied for um, when the trials were done. But still the issues go on. This was a story, I don't know if you remember this, Lorraine Bayless, who was a lady in the States who's... Um, whose caregivers in a residential nursing home, or I think it was apartment blocks, had phoned to say this lady has collapsed and the ambulance operator told them to start doing CPR. And she said, no, I'm, I can't do CPR, I'm not going to do it for this lady. And there was a, a global outcry that the nurse had killed the patient by not doing CPR. But of course, the truth was far more subtle, which was that this lady had made an advanced care plan that said that she did not want to have CPR in the event of her collapse and her family very much agreed. It was our beloved mother and grandmother's wish to die naturally and without any kind of life-prolonging intervention, the family said. We understand the 911 tape of this event has caused concern, but our family knows that mum had full knowledge of the limitations of Glenwood Gardens and is at peace. That didn't get reported very well. I had to go and look in the, um, the inquest um, equivalent in America to try and find that, because once the story had started, it kind of stopped with scandal, nurse didn't do CPR. We never actually found out the full story except if you went to find it. And that's a real problem, I think, for many people and their families, their relatives. So in terms of Rosa, we've filled in her forms, we've relieved her pain, and she wants to stay at home with her partner. She wants to enjoy her grandkids, her art gallery, she wants to enjoy their company, she wants to enjoy bacon rolls and sherry. In fact, the most effective intervention I made as a junior doctor was from a dying patient. I didn't know what to do. He was in pain. He was upset and distressed. I said, what would you like? He said, a bacon roll. I thought, I could get a bacon roll. I can organise that. And I did, and that was probably the best thing I ever did in two years of pre-registration in medicine. But anyway, <laughs> she's also very frail, and she needs help to the bathroom and to eat as well. And my question here for her and the family is, what do we need to do now? What do we need to plan for her? And overwhelmingly, what I think we need is human care. We know that a lack of social care increases the need for secondary care. I always think the data is a bit dodgy because there's no trial done of better social care, so how do we really know? But certainly I think there are enough questions to feel that we're not doing enough for people who are in our greatest need. But what's really interesting is I think that the deficiencies and the cuts in funding to our social care service very often fall on family members. And family members can struggle because old, frail people in particular can take a while to die. They don't often die quickly. So caregivers are giving a huge amount of themselves. A big study in America, basically carers describing strain versus no strain have higher mortality themselves. They die more often themselves. I think we have to be really careful when we're talking about home care to make sure we're funding and supporting people enough to do the, just the basic things that, which are everything. Feeding, getting to the toilet, getting dressed, getting washed. These are the real fundamentals of life. And I would hate to see that home death going the same way as home birth. I have so many women with postnatal depression who say how failed they feel as mothers because they didn't give birth at home and to plan. Life is messy. Things don't go according to, to your best wishes. I think guilt is a terrible, terrible thing to have, particularly when it comes from the medical profession. And I just want to be really cautious that people don't end up feeling that they have failed their relative if they end up in a hospice or a hospital. That might be where they need to go. 
The other big problem is we have is about the actual mode of death right at the very end. So this is the Daily Mail, helpful as ever, um, telling us that um, people die of thirst in care homes and on the NHS. And of course people do die of dehydration, but I don't think as many die of thirst. And the problem is that the freedom of information and request that was put in by the Telegraph, where the story originally came from, asked about the causes of death. And the causes of death are indeed listed as dehydration in many people who are old and frail and who stop drinking because they have no thirst and reflex anymore. They don't feel thirsty or hungry. They can have mouth care, but they're not thirsty. They're not complaining of thirst. And yet that was misinterpreted by the newspapers as dehydration and neglect. And that means in practical terms that when I have someone who is old and frail and comfortable and peaceful and dying at home, relatives say, but won't she be thirsty? We're not giving her fluids. Won't she die of thirst? And it's a huge problem. And it ends up, I think, with a lot of emergency admissions completely inappropriately or subcut fluids, which should often cause more trauma than they're ever worth. I think we have a big issue here and I'm afraid that we're not tackling it at source which really is with misconceptions and it's really very sad to me that societies like the Alzheimer's Society seem to support this campaign and seem to vilify any death where dehydration might be part of it when actually it is part very often of a good natural death. But there's also things that I think we do get wrong. So this is um, Prue Leith asking why did her brother die in agony? And the nurses who came to the home of her brother said, if you knew how many times we were asked to give more morphine, we would willingly do it. All over the country, in and out of hospitals, people are suffering like your dad. It's so unnecessary. And there's a graph which I cut because of time that basically shows that we were prescribing lots of morphine in palliative care and then we were prescribing less of it. And it just so happened it was the time when Harold Shipman was around. And I think we have all become a bit scared of morphine at the end of life, certainly um, in general practice. You know, we, we have registers, quite rightly, we, we have to show what we've used, what we haven't used, quite rightly. But I think there has been a bit of a fear around it. And I think um, better support would be really helpful um, on an ongoing basis. We're, we're getting better now, I think, with having emergency boxes and things like that. But I think there still is a huge fear um, with doctors and nurses, but also with patients and their families who are terrified that we're going to kill their relative through use of morphine rather than making their exit far more comfortable. The other big issue I think we have is that of false hope. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Stanley Brunsky, who's an American who has set up a clinic who will offer to cure cancer. And every six months or a year or so, there's someone in the UK trying to raise a million pounds to take their terminally ill relative to the States to have absolutely non-evidence-based nonsense expensively done to them. And there's a real issue here because people see that and they think that's great, the NHS is obviously not good enough, there's a cure being offered elsewhere. And yet, it, it very rarely goes questioned because people are vulnerable and no one wants to make someone feel bad for trying something. But actually, false hope is a really big problem and I think there have been numerous study done, done, studies done that says that people at the end of life do have hope, but what they hope for is pleasure in small things. They don't necessarily hope for a cure. And somehow I think when charlatans are around, they can make that hope into something far more than it can realistically be, or far different, I should say, than it should realistically be. And I want to flag up the great threat from the Saatchi Bill, um, which has now transmuted itself into the Access to Medical Treatments Bill, and has been pushed through, whipped through Parliament just now. Um, and this is Lord Saatchi, whose wife died tragically with ovarian cancer a few years ago, saying that um, you would need a fleet of excavators to dig a mass grave for this year's cancer dead in Britain's hospices where 80% of the patients with a life expectancy of two weeks are dying with cancer. So a very negative view of hospices there, I think, and also a very negative view of death, in that death is always something that can be avoided. And the Saatchi Bill, or the Access to Medical Treatments Bill, essentially is going to make it um, legal for doctors to do any experimental treatment without a literature review and with no research evidence whatsoever, as long as a patient is willing to take the risk and the bill will ensure that the doctor cannot be sued. I see major problems with that for people who are at the end of their life. I think this is an open door to quackery, to false hope and to worse deaths for people who are already terminally ill. Right to your MP. The other thing um, to flag up um, is that after death, I suppose, and it ties up with this idea of the perfect death and death um, being at home, always being best. I don't think that's true. And there is research evidence that says that even where death didn't occur in the right place, the place where the person said they'd want to die, 
most carers and relatives actually feel in retrospect after their relative has died that care was in the right place or the best place for them. Harms are always possible. Um, I was speaking to a person a while ago who was telling me that she can no longer go into her living room because that's where her husband died. And she has such strong memories of him being there. She really feels as though she can't go back into that part of the house. She feels as though it would be better if he'd went somewhere else to die. And I'm just worried that we idealise death a little bit and we're making it a bit hard for people to say what they would really like. We've also got families that don't always or haven't always had best relationships between each other, people who've had history of abuse, whatever type, beforehand. And these things can come into sharp focus at the end of life. Many of my patients wouldn't go near hospices because they're scary places where you go to die. We do our best to try and, um, try and change that opinion. But people um, and in general are quite scared and lots of things can happen that I wouldn't have necessarily expected. Most deaths are delivered by our district nurses. Our district nurses have been um, cut by a third in Glasgow in the last five years. Our district nurses are amazing. We could not function without them. Most of the time we have no specialist palliative care nurse involvement. Sometimes we do and we're very, very grateful for that when it happens. But the people who are doing most of the work often are quite unsupported, not very well paid and told they should do better all the time by their paymasters. And I think it's really hard to look after someone when you have less time to do it because the things that count most are the things that take the extra bit of time. At the end of a day of a rush surgery, I always feel like I've sold some patients short. The best week I can remember in general practice was a couple of years ago, just before um, Christmas. No one wanted to come and see us. We had empty appointments, which meant I had 20 minutes per, pa per patient. It was just wonderful. I had cups of teas in patients' houses when I was doing home visits. It was just wonderful. My heart was singing with the joy of general practice, how great it was. But it's not like that every day, and I think we have to really get real. We don't need expensive technology kit a lot of the time. What we need is time to spend with our patients and find out what they think is important and find a way to deliver that for them. When it comes down to equity and palliative care, it's something the Daily Mail don't seem to be very concerned about. Um, I suppose one of my issues I have is that some of my patients can't get access to hospice beds because they're not complicated enough. And this is one of the tensions, I think, between generalism and specialism working in a resource-limited environment. We did set up the NHS because the patchwork of charity hospitals were failing. And I just wonder when there is evidence out there about inequity of access, particularly for people in lower social classes, whether we're doing the right thing by all of our patients. We definitely need our specialists. I'm in hotline to my, my local hospice for, for specialist care. But we do need to be giving good enough care to the majority of our old, frail people who are living for longer with all these multimorbid diseases and who are, I think are getting a raw deal from the guidelines just now and from the lack of social care and from our lack of district nurses that would normally be doing all, all this for them. And I do think that palliative care continues to have a bit of an image problem. When people are at the end of their life or coming to the end of their life, the mention of palliative care quite often can really put the frighteners into people. And I think sometimes what palliative care actually is, is good generalist care, rebranded slightly, perhaps not being quite honest, but really prioritising quality over quantity and really getting down to the heart, I suppose, of what it is that patients really want. And I just wonder whether that's something to flag up and whether more cross-working even with geriatrics might be useful again in the future. So I'm going to conclude, so we've got time maybe for one question, or if you want, maybe no one has any questions. So in conclusion, um, I think we need to get a bit more real and challenge the media more, especially when it comes down to CPR, especially when it comes down to thirst versus dehydration, especially when it comes down to use of morphine at the end of life. I think we need to be good enough rather than always going for perfection and excellence in palliative care and really looking at fair resources for needs, really prioritising hands-on care because that's what people actually need. And more than anything, I, need, I think the society needs to own death rather than it belonging to medicine anymore. So death has always been with us and it always will be. It is absolutely inevitable and it is not a failure of medicine. We are all going to die. What might be a failure of medicine, though, is bad death. Thank you very much. <laughs>